We're born pretty close to a blank slate compared to other animals. And what we do with our big headed, tiny little bodies is we watch the culture around us and we absorb it as much as possible because our survival isn't based on our independent individual ability to survive. We're weaker, stupider, have worse eyesight and senses than any other animal our size. It's the collective knowledge of our tribe. We all depend on our local cultural package to survive. And so what we tend to do is blindly follow the needs of our tribe. So the point isn't to be right or wrong, it's to copy. Bonjour, bonjour, and welcome to another episode of EveryoneHatesMarketers.com, the no fluff actionable marketing podcast for people sick of marketing bullshit. I'm your host, Louis Grenier. In today's episode, you'll learn how to become a more effective marketer using evolutionary psychology. Fancy. My guest today is the godfather of website conversion rate optimization, CRO, best-selling author, certified Tai Chi Chuan martial arts instructor, uh, international keynote speaker, all of that, all of that. And I actually used to follow him very closely a couple of years ago, not a couple, like almost 10 years ago when I tried to create my own agency, commercial rate optimization agency in Dublin. And I used to look up to, I mean, I used to, I'm still looking up to him, but very much, you know, look to closely to this, to my guest today, uh, because I tried to copy him a lot and it didn't work. So anyway, Timash, <laughs> welcome aboard. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, and, and don't blame me for your poor career choices either. I am actually, yeah. I am, it's your fault. Um, but it, it's a funny story because, I mean, it's not that funny for me because I actually burnt out trying to do this thing and it didn't last that long. I tried to create kind of the market of conversion rate optimization in Dublin, Ireland, right? And yeah. I thought I was very clever, you know? I thought I was very clever to like, to be the only one doing this. And I soon realized after that actually I wasn't clever at all. No one knew what it was and therefore there was no demand for it. Therefore, no one was willing to pay for it. And the only clients I could get were like, took me months and months to educate them about it and, and whatever. So it was a, yeah, it was what we call me. a missionary cell. You were a little in front of the wave, I guess you could say. But you know, in fairness, there's no wave. I still don't see any conversion rate optimization being talked about uh, in Ireland whatsoever. Agencies and consultants, you know, it's like paid ads and, and stuff like that. They do a bit of CRO, but it's definitely not something they lead with at all. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know if there will ever be a wave here. Um, so, Tim, did you know that 40% of Americans um, don't believe in the theory of evolution? Yes, and 25% uh, of adult Americans can't find the U.S. on an unlabeled world map. So the, the future is not bright. So I'm asking you this not to, you know, blame uh, Americans in general, but because like the very thing that you specialize in and that you that you've uh, dedicated your latest book to is around evolutionary psychology. So it implies that humans weren't born 2000 or so years ago. Um, <laughs> right? Well, it apparently in the Bible it says five or 6000 years ago. Yeah. And the world right. was made okay. in seven days. And yeah, some people can't understand the uh, symbolic meaning of that and take that very literally, I guess, in the US, but that, that's okay. So what is evolutionary psychology? Uh, it, it's, it's very simple. The idea is that we didn't come from nothing. We are the product of a long line of evolution from the earliest viruses on earth, which are still with us today, obviously, uh, through more complicated uh, forms of life. So we picked up things along the way. There are some general mechanisms that we share with insects and reptiles and other mammals. And then there's some things on the tail end of our evolution that are make us distinctly human. So to understand our behavior and what brains evolve for, you have to kind of retrace that arc and see what we picked up along the way. I know a lot of people who really strongly believe, I mean, they are 100% sure that they are rational beings taking, you know, <laughs> rational decisions, right? Who are in yeah. control. They think they are in control all the time and, and whatnot. And those are usually the same people who also think that in B2B, people take rational decisions and all of that. Right, so, that B2B is different than B2C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can't do that because it's serious. It's a serious industry. Like, it, you, can't, you can't just do that. You know, it's, it's serious. They're wearing suits. What do you say to those who believe that they are rational beings? You're wrong. 
It's pretty simple. The, the conscious mind can't possibly process all of the things required to keep you alive. So most of your brain is working on autopilot and doing automatic quick reactions. There's the quick and the dead, and all of your ancestors were quick or you wouldn't be here. So uh, what, what we think of as the rational mind is only brought into play when we face a new situation we've never faced before and it's safe. So if it's not safe, our automatic brain is going to deal with the danger. If it's something we know what to do with, it's not novel or new to us, then our automatic brain is still going to deal with that part. So it's only if it's safe right now and I'm facing something that I don't understand where the rational mind gets involved. I was actually writing an article today and I was quoting um, uh, one of your colleagues, I would say, like uh, who wrote a book called uh, Incognito, The Secret Life of the Brain, uh, D David mm. Eagleman. Right? And he was mentioning the fact that uh, folks who were diagnosed with anterograde amnesia uh, which means that they cannot consciously recall new experiences in their lives. You could teach them something one day like Tetris or tennis or whatever if they didn't know how to do it. The next day, they'll tell you they have no fucking idea what you're talking about. Like they don't even know what Tetris is. Yet, they their skills would have improved the same way as others uh, who didn't have that amnesia. Basically meaning that their you know, unconscious, subconscious have learned the thing, but the consciousness hasn't surfaced it. And I found that absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And then there's also different everything. kinds of learning. There's learning about, you know, body stuff, like you say, athletic performance, muscle memories, certain skills, how to do a golf swing, how to do a basketball layup. Uh, those kind of things uh, can be done um, differently than, I guess you'd say, factual knowledge or storing memories or things like that. It's it, The body has its own way of remembering, you could say. So why don't we start with the, the rational versus irrational thing um, in terms of what are the implications for folks doing marketing? Uh, it's very simple. We're doing it wrong. We're all trying to, say, cater to Mr. Spock from Star Trek, the logical Vulcan, you know, who makes rational mm -hmm. decisions. Well, is this our plan is $10, $10 a month or it's $100 a year if you prepay. Well, you're making me do math and I hate that. By the way, that's why I got into marketing to avoid all the math. Uh, but nobody thinks like that. What we do is we just make some, again, quick decisions and we take shortcuts all the time. And the brain isn't there to make economically optimal decisions. It's there to do well enough to keep you alive. And that's it. So again, if you, if you have to come back to one thing, the function of the brain is to keep you alive. It's not to make perfect decisions. You don't have perfect memory. You don't have infinite time to look at your marketing options or all the choices you make in a typical day. So we're on autopilot. And anybody that thinks differently and is designing for Mr. Spock is doing it completely wrong. So how do we do it? Well, what you have to do is appeal to our emotions and our automatic reactions. There's some built-in biases in the brain. One that is commonly known is that there's a bias towards threats as opposed to upside. So if I say, hey, here's some ice cream, would you like it? But let me just hit you on the back of the hand with a hammer before I give it to you. Do you want the ice cream still? No. No, right. Thank you. No matter how much you like ice cream, you know, we're more attuned to pain and pain avoidance because, again, that's a survival thing. And then I can figure out if I want to eat the ice cream later after I run away from the bear and it doesn't kill me. So um, the one thing we can do is frame things with a negative frame. If I said, hey, there's a, you have to have this operation, there's a 95% you know, chance everything will go right and you'll be fully healed, okay? Or the same doctor walks in and says, yeah, there's a 5% chance that you'll be maimed, crippled, or die on the operating table. You know, you're going to experience those things differently because you're attuned to the downside. So one big mistake marketers make all the time is they're always doing the happy, happy talk. You'll have a brighter smile and great breath if you use our tooth whitening crap. No, you should tell me you're going to have, you have gray, yellow teeth. You don't open your mouth and you have resting bastard face. You're going to not ever mm. date. You'll die alone. And you're, the only way they'll find you is after the cat's done trying to eat your dead body, he'll cry because of hunger. Okay, that's how you sell tooth whitening. You don't, so we need to rub salt into the wound and be super negative. And a lot of marketers say, well, that's off brand for us and we're not going to do that. That's your, that's your stupid marketer's voice, is that it? <laughs> yeah, that's the stupid marketer's voice. That's All off right. brand. <laughs> that's a conversation, Ender. I mean, like, where do, you, where do you go with that, right? You can't argue yeah. with those brand people. They're like, 
Yeah. So, so that would have been my next question. You can't argue with them. So you just don't work with them or you just... No, no. What you can, can do, you do is, is just to say, hey, you know, would, uh, what I typically did when I ran my conversion rate optimization agency, Site Tuners, which I no longer run, I sold my share to partners. You know, we would do small tests and, and that's exactly where testing and conversion rate optimization comes in. So you say to the client, uh, it's like, oh, we did this negative messaging versus positive messaging. We just try it on 5% of your website traffic. Let's see how it works. Oh, hey, look, this negative approach made you an annualized $50 million a year more. But you know, we can always just stick with what you already have. Mm -hmm. When you start talking money, it's a different conversation. So there are ways to do it, but you have to hijack just a small percentage of the traffic or do small tests and verify the financial value. Then you can have a conversation with the CMO level. Right. What do you say to people who would say that it's manipulation almost to lean on that negativity bias so much? Well, it's not just negativity bias. And by the way, I mean, there are a lot of people that use these as like little tricks and hacks, and I'm not a fan of that. Here's 200 ways to persuade people. I mean, I think there's definitely an ethics conversation that needs to happen here. You can't just be completely manipulative. There's some sociological studies that did like the 14 signs of fascism, like when a country is about to flip from a democracy to, to an autocracy. And they're, you know, it's a playbook, you know, it's like encourage the military, suppress the arts, you know, destroy the, the voice of labor in, in, in the, the economy. I mean, it's, it's a playbook. So you can use this stuff for evil. There's no question. And people do. I think it's very important for marketers to actually be grounded in proper ethics. So your latest book is Unleash your primal brain. Yes, um, unleash your primal brain, demystifying how we think and why we act. There you go. He had it ready. Uh, if you're listening to the audio, he's showing the book. Uh, if you're watching it on video, you know what I'm talking about. So why don't we pick one, you know, theme or concept in there that you're like proud of or that you tend to talk about the most or that you really want to talk about today mm. and try to really like break it down so that people can unleash their primal brain right in their work but also outside so let's let's try to get to something specific sure yeah um well i think uh, what i'd like to focus on then is the fact that we are built to be tribal mm -hmm. we're built to polarize over the smallest things in fact i'm working on a new keynote the primal roots of polarization and how to overcome them but one of the things we don't realize is like you know we talk about us versus them we see polarization at all levels of society from countries to neighborhoods to uh you know even within families and that's not a bug, it's a feature. Mm -hmm. Human beings are designed to absorb the cultural package around them. I don't know if you ever saw The Matrix, that movie, uh, uh -huh. where, so like um, Neo needs to learn how to fly a helicopter all of a sudden. So he down, somebody downloads that program into his head. All of a sudden he can fly a helicopter or shoot a, a machine gun or whatever. So people are kind of like that. We're born pretty close to a blank slate compared to other animals. And what we do with our big headed, tiny little bodies is we watch the culture around us and we absorb it as much as possible because our survival isn't based on our independent individual ability to survive. We're, we're weaker, stupider, have worse eyesight and senses than, than any other animal our size. It's the collective knowledge of our tribe. So you take a modern human uh, in an urban environment, you put him in the Arctic, he'll die. You'll take somebody from the Arctic and you put him in the outback of Australia, he'll die. You take that Australian Aborigine, you put him in the middle of New York City, he'll die. We all depend on our local cultural package to survive. And so what we tend to do is blindly follow the needs of our tribe. So the point isn't to be right or wrong, it's to copy and repeat the beliefs of our tribe. And so that's what leads to polarization. And like you said, that operates on every level of marketing, society, yeah. families, communities. So I, uh, it, this analogy that you just made or this thing that you just said about, you know, someone, let, I, I'd say considering there is no internet maybe because then access to information changes the game, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I could go into the Arctic, but if I'm, I have a bit of money and the information, I could manage how, you know, figure out how to survive. But let's say, in a, from what you're no, saying, no, it's wait, like... Wait, wait, no, no, I'm going to interrupt you because... 
there have been cases where really well-equipped modern expeditions have gone to the Arctic, you know, people right. like Shackleton and stuff, and they've died. They don't know right. how to survive there. That's false. Okay. okay. All the money and knowledge in the world isn't going to save you if you didn't spend generations of people before you didn't function in that environment and pass on their subtle and deep knowledge. Okay, thanks. No, that, that, makes a, that makes a lot of sense. I never thought about it this way. That, that's very interesting. And I read somewhere else, I think it was in uh, Sapiens, um, where they were talking about humans being the only species that tell stories. Is that true? In, in a way. So language uh, was evolved for us to be able to take, transplant our experiences and put them in somebody else's head. So if I say, hey, don't go down that left fork in the, in the road in the forest because that's where the bear is, okay? That right. would be valuable information to you, right? And uh, you, you would avoid getting you know, attacked by the bear if I told you that. So stories, uh, as you'll notice, they almost always have human protagonists or at least you know, protagonists that have human features and they're told in a sequential fashion. And the most powerful story form is called the hero's journey, where you know things were good, then things went bad, then you got some allies along the way, then you slayed the dragon, and then there was a regreening of the earth. That art is basically every story ever told. You know, like a, the three act play. You know, there's a setup, the crisis, and the resolution. So those are stories that are helping us to survive. Those are stories that where we learn something about our world by from the experiences of other people. What's one thing we can do to apply that very concept you just shared? Well, one of the keys is you can't be everything to everyone. Like you say, you're not a big brand. You're not Sony, McDonald's, Disney. You know, those, those brands took hundreds of millions of dollars and many decades to build. And you, sorry, I don't care how, how you're scrumming and pivoting your way to being a unicorn. You're never going to be that kind of brand. Okay. So what you can actually, what the key to any marketing, and I think people do this backwards, is a three-step process. Identify your audience understand their values, and then design product services and campaigns to address them. So I think the key is to have a really, really narrow focus as much as possible. And if you're a mid-sized company, probably several segments that are still really narrowly focused. And if you understand those people, if you understand their values, what they live, what they, where they live, what they care about, how they communicate, then you can, in the form of stories, create marketing that's effective. So basically what you're telling them is, you know, I was dissatisfied with the world and I struggled and struggled and struggled and I came up with this thing and now here's my banner, follow my crusade, okay? But it's only going to attract the people in your narrow tribe and it should really resonate for them. Everybody else, you ignore. So the biggest mistakes brands make or businesses is they think they can sell their crap to anybody anytime. And it's not true. You have to just stay really unfocused, say no a lot, and focus on very narrow niche audiences and take the time to really live and breathe what they do. So let's dive into the value stuff. Oh, we'd okay. Say, right? All right. Well, let me give you a specific example from my Unleash Your Primal Brain book. I, so I'm going to tell you a story, and it's an objective story. What I mean by that is if you had a video camera, you, or you could record this as reality. Okay. So the matador stood in the middle of the arena. The bull came charging at him. The matador swiftly moved his cape aside and plunged a sword between the shoulder blades of the bull, striking its heart from above and killing it instantly. Now, that's objective reality. We can agree on that. Now, it really is going to be experienced differently depending on who your audience is. If I told this story for, to someone from Spain who was into bullfighting, they would say, this is about tradition. This is about man overcoming raw nature. It's about pride. It's about discipline. It's about excellence and all of that good stuff. And if I told this to someone from PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animals, they'd say, this is barbaric animal torture and murder, and you're paying to watch it and should be stopped immediately. Same story, same objective reality, very different audiences. So when I say understand your audience, it's down to that level. So let's go even deeper now. In okay. practical terms, how do we teach folks how to do this? Because you are so seasoned, your experience. I know that it's part of your subconscious now. Like, you know how to do this thing. Like, you don't have to fucking think about it, but I'm going to make you think about it a bit because I really want people to get that, you know, okay. how do you get the psychographics? Because everyone is about age and fucking jobs and industry, but that doesn't yeah, matter. The demographics, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, I can't so, that. so, so there, there's only one way and it's basically like, think about 
who you interact with as a marketer, whether you're in-house or at an agency, okay? Who do you interact with 99% of the time? Other marketers. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know, everyone hates marketers or they're all full of bullshit. And we're talking to across the cubicle or across the Zoom meeting to somebody else that's that's already kind of bought the religion and it believes the same kind of crap. And we're reinforcing each other's echo chambers. So the best thing you can do is get as close to the customer as possible. Um, and what I mean by that is go to your frontline troops. There's some big companies, for example, where the CEO famously, forget which one it was, makes every employee of the company listen in for one full day on the call center. You go down to a call center and you listen to calls. And then you get close to the customer because you see the kind of shit they hate, what they're dealing with, how they think about you and your brand, all of that bullshit. And, and then you, that's the key. Go out into the field, see your product or service being used in reality. It's one thing to say, it's like, oh, we have a better something for moms with small children. It's another one to go into their home and see their kid crawling up their leg and crying for Cheerios and all the interruptions in their day. So when I say get close to the customer, get outside your of your bubble, get to either to customer service or sales or ideally directly with customers and, and then get immerse yourself in their reality. And it's going to be subtle things you pick up that are going to shift massive things in your marketing. So you mean I can't use ChatGPT or Google Analytics for this? Is that right? <laughs> no, by the way, the PhD that I almost got, I spent seven years at University of California, San Diego, was in neural networks, AI, deep learning, oh, back yeah. in, a long time ago before the giant data sets made it all pay off. Uh, now we have no shortage of data to train them on. But anyway, uh, no, AI is not going to save you. AI is just the very smart averaging of a lot of uh, stuff people are already doing. So that's general knowledge. You need super specific knowledge about your segment. Laser focus and direct knowledge of your customers. Let's dive into that again. All right. We had three layers deep already. Let's um, go. No, I have a story. I have a story. I have another example that you shared. So you said the the, the employees go uh, one day in the call center. So there's a company called Ahrefs that does SEO, you know, SEO software. And every single marketing folks joining the team has to do customer support for two months. Perfect. And they don't do anything else, right? There was a tweet about, uh, like, the, 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 the head of marketing there was tweeting about this. And I found that phenomenal because it's so easy to talk the talk, isn't it? It's so easy to say we are customer-centric. We yeah, yeah, yeah. We're customer-centric. Customer yeah. Yes, yes. Your yes. success is, my, is our success. Bullshit, 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 right? Yeah. Walking the walk to truly give a shit and truly follow customers and truly understand mm -hmm. who they are, what they believe, their story. That's yeah. another thing. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. There's a, there was a TV show called Undercover Boss where the boss yeah. actually goes in and does frontline work in their company, you know, usually wearing a disguise, wigs, and yeah. all that. And, and you know, but what I found interesting is not only do they help the frontline employees who they have more sympathy for, but it actually changes their mindset and ch changes how they see the customers as well. So, again, very powerful Everybody in your company, you want to be customer centric, everybody should be spending time with the customers. At some but what do we need to look for then? You don't want to be directed. This is really important. I'm glad you brought this up. It's not like, well, I'm here like an anthropologist to study my customers in the wild, you know, to see how they behave in their natural habitat. You still have the intention of, you know, just like uh, you're an outside observer and you're detached and you're watching them. I'm suggesting full immersion. So where, you know, like if it's a B2B, where are the meetups? Where do these people live? What are the online forums? What do they talk about? You're always, despite what you think, going to be peripheral to their life. So you have to go to where their center of gravity is and just live there for a while. So without an intention, without like, I need to answer these three market research questions. None of that crap. You should go there completely open and just see what, what hits your consciousness So I'm sorry if that sounds a little too freeform, but but really you should have the beginner's mind, and as they say in Zen, you know you you shouldn't have any preconceptions. You're you're like I'm completely open. Let's see what hits me. It's these informal insights, and just like after talking two or three or five people, the, these these things will coalesce. Oh, that seems to be a real concern for him. I'll give you a, a specific example. A friend of mine's a, is a life and career coach, 
And she thought that she was going to work only with millennial men that are in management positions. And when she went to actually interview them and hang out with them, because I also suggested this strategy to her, she found out that these were like really narcissistic people that could easily switch jobs and thought they knew it all. And it actually was like a really crappy demographic for her. The only way to find that out is to actually just go in and see who these people are. Um, In her case, it was, I guess you could say, a shift to another segment that was a result of this. But the insights of, okay, they're entitled and can find jobs easily and then full of themselves. Well, actually, if that is your target demographic, then that already tells you about how to interact with these people. Great example. Thanks for sharing something that is like from a small business, not a massive brand. So what I think, what I found through my career trying to do this, you know, and still trying to understand people, obviously it's a lifelong pursuit. You have to trust your gut, right? And it's a very difficult thing to teach. But I wonder, you know, for junior people, uh, people who haven't started, who don't, who have this imposter syndrome or doubt themselves, is it just a matter of doing it over and over and over and over again? Uh, well, I, I would say that is it, there's there's kind of crystallized knowledge, and I forget what the other one is that, that the psychologists talk about. Basically, one is learned uh, specific facts, and the other is life wisdom that's more broad-based. So when you right. talk about, say, a chess grandmaster, they could take one look at a chessboard and instantly know how the whole game's going to play out, okay? That's, that's the wisdom, okay? That's not the mechanics of try to take the center of the board and control it or any of that kind of reductionist stuff that would be the step-by-step learning process. What I think of as a more successful career in any field is focusing on those broadly applicable wisdom things and trusting your intuition is a huge part of that. So it's not about specific knowledge. Um, In fact, one of the things that I hate about marketers is that they're focused on the technology. It's virtual reality. It's, I mean, remember a year ago it was like Clubhouse. Who the hell is on Clubhouse, right? Uh, uh, but whatever it is, a, a hologram suppositories, I don't know what it's going to be tomorrow, right? But it's never oh, about oh, technology. I really hope not. Sorry. Yeah, I really hope not too. Yeah. No, uh, no, not that. not that there's anything wrong with that, but just not my thing. Anyway, but it's not about the technology. It's about these kind of broader wisdom lessons and intuitions, a huge part of that tuning your whole being to doing your job as opposed to just trying to use just the mental logical part of your mind, which again is really, really a tiny part of what, what, what you have access to. So first principles versus so-called best practices, right? Yeah. And um, also best practices are in the known place. Okay. If something is well understood, here's a checklist of 17 things you have to do not to crash an airplane. That's why Pilots use checklists. That's a best practice. But the real discovery comes from things you don't know. So you should be getting used to asking questions. Uh, uh, Why do people do this particular thing? Or why are mortgage default rates so high for, you know, single parents? Well, it seems obvious. I thought I knew the answer, but I dug deeper and look, I discovered something. So the only way to discover anything new is to ask questions. It's not to parrot other people's best practices, you know, growth hacks is take my swipe file, you know, all this bullshit. Do you have another example? Uh, Your first example is really good of specifically understanding, having this aha moment about discovering the values of the people we seek to serve. I'll tell you a little tactic that that I'm doing right now. As you know, I I do a lot of keynote speaking as well as corporate training and university courses all over the world, a couple of hundred appearances in the last decade plus. But I also ran a conference. I ran the conversion conference, which was the first conversion rate optimization conference internationally that wasn't tied to a vendor or something like that. So it still goes on every year. I'm not involved anymore with that or my former agency, but it happens in Las Vegas, Berlin, and London every year. Um, So I'm both the keynote speaker and I'm a, um, I guess, a conference organizer or a former conference organizer. So here's a tactic that I'm going to be doing. I'm launching a new podcast. It's called Ace the Agenda. And it's aimed at people that program large conferences and hire paid keynote speakers. Now, I know a little bit about that world, but I'm going to be interviewing people that shining the spotlight on them and giving them the opportunity to speak about their problems and their world. And through that, I'm going to learn how to be a more effective salesperson for selling my own keynotes. Of course, I'm also interviewing people that are in a position to hire me. So it's a double benefit. But this show is not about audience or my reputation. I might have a few dozen people listening to it. 
Uh, but it, it's going to be people that are talking about the thing that I want to learn about. I'm asking them a bunch of questions. Curiosity is such a big skill, right, to develop and not trying to be know-it-all. And it's not because you subscribe to a few private newsletter on marketing that you know it all. And I, that's why I love the field, you know, this, this kind of constant discovery, trying to understand what's going on in people's head, trying to fill the gaps. I just fucking love that. So you mentioned this kind of three-piece framework, you know, I don't find the audience understanding the value, building the product. You mentioned this kind of objective reality versus how people would see it, like with the bull story, which I think is a very, very good example. You mentioned your friend who's a coach and how she discovered that she wasn't serving a set of demographic, uh, firmographic. She was serving folks who thought they were the best in the world. And going back to the tribal thing, right? So I think we need to backtrack a bit to the, you mentioned about the book, which is the fact that we are born to be in tribes. We are born to have this kind of solidarity between each other, but also the polarization. There's a cognitive bias where You know, you probably had that in school where you pick a team, like the teacher will pick a team for you and say, no, you're you're there and now you're there. And so the two teams completely randomly created. Right. As soon as you have the team, you think you're better than the other team, right? Absolutely. Think, you bond with your tribe because your survival depends right on it. For no fucking reason. Exactly. Than... For the for a trivial reason. Like there's actually, this happened to me. I was in Australia, first time there, and they have this crazy game there called Australian Rules Football. And nice. uh, where people are just like, no pads, they run for a giant oval field, climb over each other. It's just a brutal game. And I wanted to watch a real match because I'd seen it on TV. So I went with this woman, a, a friend of mine, and she was a three generation fan of, of one team. And so she got me a little scarf with their logo. And I became an instant rabid fan of that team. I didn't know shit about Australian rules football or that team or the opposing team. And I became tribal instantly. It's deeply ingrained in our survival. We have to be good team players. We don't have to be right. In fact, Being a member of the tribe means we override our own direct experience and life experience and have to instead parrot what our tribe wants to say without changing it ever. So like, how can those crazy conspiracy theory people, blah, blah, blah? Well, they're doing it for evolutionary reasons that are tapping into our survival and need to belong to tribes. That's the explanation. Let's do a little exercise together. Like, um, sure. Let's say we are trying to understand, trying to sell to conspiracy theorists, people who believe that bears are not real. Mm -hmm. Do you know that there's a, it's a running joke on Reddit, uh, but I'm pretty sure some people <laughs> really believe that bears are not real. But anyway, let's try to understand things from their perspective, right? Looking at the objective reality, which is things fly in the sky. Let's try to understand from their point of view how they see the world, right? What comes to mind? So it's it's not a, the specific belief system they have. It's, a, again, about strongly believing and transmitting efficiently and without changes any beliefs of the tribe that surrounds them. Right. So the way that you take someone out of a cult is you deprogram or you physically take them out of the cult and you spend time with them, giving them a different belief system, surrounding them with people that believe something different. That's the only way to decult someone. Okay, but the thing I want to say about tribes, though, is originally we had one tribe. This is where the opportunity lies. Originally, it was one tribe, a few dozen people, about a third of them were genetically related to us. They were operating clearly in the physical environment for which they were adapted. And, and so it was really important to learn everything that they knew. Right now, we live in multiple tribes in modern society. So you could say, so I'm a member of, you can't see this unless you're looking at the video of the streamlined haircut tribe. I, I shave my head, right? Um, I'm a member of the Mercedes driving tribe. I'm a member of the immigrant tribe. I was born in the former Soviet Union and now live in the US. Some of these tribes are voluntary. Some are not, things that don't, they can't change. But which tribe we're aligned with depends on which one is activated at a current moment. If I'm hungry and there's strong people around me and it's the zombie apocalypse, I'm going to join that tribe to get food because that's my overriding need. But we can consciously shift. So you have to, you can try to attach people to your tribe using those evolutionary mechanisms like peer pressure, like modeling by example, like creating fear and uncertainty, like having a painful initiation that makes them value being members of the tribe. All of the evolutionary mechanisms are still there, but you can apply them consciously to attaching them to new and better tribes. And this is why the the bullshit of demographic, firmographic first, like to create personas or segment or whatever. <laughs> oh God, don't get me doesn't started work. on personas. In my landing page optimization book, I shit all over personas. So there's some things that are more likely to be permanent tribes. Your location, especially if you don't move or you grew up in a certain spot. Your religion, because 
whatever the belief system of the religion is, you can be brainwashed from the moment of birth into it. And it's very hard to break that. It's very hard for people to leave religions, for example, because uh, they're losing their whole community support system, belief system all at once. Uh, so there's some tribes that are stickier and more powerful, no question about that. But at least in the workplace or in marketing or limited consumer behaviors, we can influence which tribe they're a part of. So how do we do that? Anyway, you, you mentioned a few examples of how to detach people from a cult or how to, how to attach them to your tribe in a nice sense of the word. So you said peer pressure, a fear, like modeling the behavior, like showing an example. Yeah. The last thing you said is powerful initiation, right? Yes. And I love, I love that. So maybe I want to you know, break that down slightly because straight away we're thinking of so sorority, fraternity. I went through one. I, I studied mechanical engineering before doing marketing in the School of Engineering. We did this huge weekend where everyone got drunk and just fought each other and did this crazy fucking thing. And <laughs> which, um, which university was this? Oh, it was a shitty university uh, in Orléans, an hour from Paris. <laughs> and, but that's, that's like engineering schools in France, they all do the same thing. It's well, it's funny. Different. I have an analogy that's, that's similar to that. So when I was in, at UC San Diego, I did a double major undergraduate in computer engineering and cognitive science. And the computer engineering, there was a weeder class and every major has one, you know, like where you use it to get people out of the major if it's very popular, right? And in our case, it was assembly language programming and you had to be in this special lab with these computers and people spent so much time in that class that they actually had a cot that you could sleep on because people spent all night there and somebody was always sleeping on that cot. And that was a painful initiation, sleep deprivation. And if you don't pass that class, you can't advance to the upper division classes in the major. So the, sometimes actually doing what I call the takeaway cell, making, putting a barrier in front of people and making them prize something and saying, no, no, this is exclusive. This is not for people like you. And you have to show your determination. So in some cases in marketing, you want to make the action easier. You want to create easier triggers, make it trivial for people to act, maybe even make it the default for them to do what you want them to do. But in other cases, if you want them to value being a member of your tribe, you make it difficult and painful to get in. So in what cases do we go for the easy slash default option? And in what cases do we go for the... Uh, well, what you want to do is anything involving, uh, especially continuity plans or payment over time, because we also tend to devalue the future, it probably won't arrive in the form we think it will. So there's this future discounting effect, which is why we put things on a credit card and pay over time and then pay those incredible fees. So anything with auto subscriptions, I would say make that the default in your business model. If they've shown that high-end brands in the retail environment, the nastier the salespeople are in their stores, the more people want to buy. Like you walk into a Gucci store and they look you up and down. There's this movie called Pretty Woman where she's shopping on Rodeo Drive and she's a prostitute. And they're like, you obviously don't have the money to be even in this store kind of thing. And and, and so that actually I mean, works. Big makes, mistake. Huge. Yeah. Sorry, big mistake. Quick. Exactly. Great line. Yeah, obviously you... Uh, that's a fun movie. But um, we would, so that's what you want to do is just kind of put it behind the velvet rope, VIP access. You know, you, you uh, no, this is not for you or pay 10 times as much if you want it, you know, that kind of thing. So prizing things and making them difficult to get to is actually a good thing. Where is that coming from, from an evolutionary perspective? I'm willing to suffer for the group at my own individual expense. That's the message you're really sending. And in, we have sick, twisted versions of these initiation rituals. You know, like you say, fraternities and sororities. Some people die in hazings. You have gang jump-ins. Uh, mm -hmm. You have boot camp. But you, you can design this for brands, too. Like Tony Robbins has his, like, follow me around the world and fly around on my jet plane, you know, $25,000 a month level. Okay, that is prizing. That's making somebody say, oh, I want direct access to Tony. So signals, it's all about signaling. It's all about status, really, right? Yeah, this isn't for everybody. This is kind of like the, the, the military analogy would be of this would be Navy SEALs in the U.S. military. The special forces, one of them is called the Navy SEALs, and they have a brutal training program. In fact, one of their bases is here in San Diego. Some people die sometimes, uh, and they, they have, I think, something like a 70, 80 percent attrition rate through that training before you can become a Navy SEAL. And it's voluntary. You have to ask to leave. And once you leave, you can't graduate mm -hmm. in that class anymore. That's an extreme example because they have an extreme mission, but you have to, your life being placed in the hands of other people on your team. So it has to be a very high degree of team cohesion. And that's why it's done. 
I, I love that type of topic because it just goes back to the root of who you are and, and it's just so helpful from a marketing perspective. So maybe let's get practical one last time about this. I'm going to challenge you again to try to you know come up with an example. I'm sure you'll have it. But you know when we think about this tribal thing where we switch tribes, some tribes are more important than others. Uh, but let's say for the tribes that don't matter that much, basically the ones that we work for, right? The mm -hmm. ones that are like... I'm uh, an espresso guy. I'm a whatever the fuck. Something uh, is... Well, let's say Android maybe... versus iPhone. Let's say for smaller businesses and startups and even consultants, how did, can they, they can actually leverage that very thing? There has to be an affinity. So the one thing you can't do is broadcast. This is, this is the point that you can't build your brand by saying, we're the, I'm the best divorce attorney in the world. Nobody's going to believe you. Okay. But if you say, I, I went through a very painful divorce and my wife took me to the cleaners and took my house and took my kids and everything else. And I lost my career. And, and so I specialize in contested divorces for rich people. And I only represent men. Do you see how narrowly I just mm. took my niche audience? That's because I have direct experience in that. And then my origin myth, the story I'm going to tell is going to be woven right into my website and all of my marketing is I'm going to say what I went through, how I struggled after that, how I came up with this system to make sure those men are treated fairly in those circumstances. And right now I'm here to help every man, you know, that's, uh, that's in that same position to, to go through that process as painfully, painlessly as possible. So you exactly. act as a magnet to attract people as opposed to broadcasting at them with a bullhorn saying, I'm a divorce attorney that works with anyone. And this is why it's so important to have a point of view in the right sense of the word, because without a point of view, without this story, without this narrative, mm -hmm. your actions seem random, right? It's like, yes. why the fuck are you doing this? You're just generic. So flip yeah. to the, to the you know, the, do a Google search on divorce lawyers in your city, you'll find hundreds of them. Okay, which one do I pick? You have one in a 200 chance that I'll even call you, much less pick you. I've been toying with this idea before of like, why are some experts like you or bigger brands unforgettable in a sense? Why is there something about them that makes them noticed? And why others who are trying to do the same thing just feel so boring, right? Mm. Like just what I thought I, I uncovered is the fact that they have a point of view. Like they are willing to tell, you know. Absolutely. Thing, right? I think point of view is critical. And one of the things that supports a consistent point of view, in addition to being clear on your origin myth, values and things like that is editorial voice because you're going to be telling a lot of stories but everything coming out of your brand should have a distinct editorial voice so if i just ask you right now like what are the three adjectives if if, if your brand was a person or your business was a person use three adjectives to describe it and so in my case it might be direct funny smart okay maybe not the smart part but the other two not funny either but okay so everything that comes out of my business should have that editorial voice it's it's free you just have to apply it religiously email headlines website navigation labels every communication you have with the people on the phone everything has to be consistent that's one of the almost like free things that you get but you have to be really disciplined by making sure that voice permeates everything that you put out and then it's like oh it's those people that's the reaction yeah. you want to have it's so you, you have to walk the walk to go back to the example we gave earlier you can't just talk the talk you have to like behave like the things you're claiming to be you exactly you have to embody it and that's one of the things yeah. the processes i take people through when i'm consulting through timash.com with executives i go back and do the foundational stuff like we talked about niching understanding values then coming up with campaigns. And that's the very last step. What's your product? How do you price it? How do you talk about it? But the consistency and that foundation has to be there at the purpose, mission, editorial tone. None of that is accidental. And if you don't build that in and you just kind of gotten to where you are by accident, you're building on quicksand in my mind. Yeah, you're building a house of cards. I can see how experienced you are as a speaker uh, and someone who goes on podcasts because you, you managed to name drop your consulting, uh, your book and all of that, just so naturally in the sentences, you know, like when I consult for teamhash.com and all of that, that's good. It's good. It's good. I have a couple of questions to ask you that I always ask guests before, before I, I let you go, but I wanted to thank you for, for being so like interesting to chat with and having so many good examples and stories and stuff like that. That was very enjoyable on my side. So what are the top three resources that you'd like to recommend people today? Yeah, you mentioned one of them already. I'm a huge fan of Sapiens by Noah Yuval Harari. Just such a brilliant mind, just unbelievable. And if you want to understand um, 
you know, the some of the anthropological stuff. Uh, Jared Diamond wrote a big, thick book also called The World Before Yesterday. Uh, and it was about how, again, just kind of the evolutionary aspects of how we're designed to be in small tribes, and now we're living in these complicated civilizations. And then again, my own book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, which you can find info about at primalbrain.com. So, so I think of books as weapons. I have a bookshelf behind me that's uh, about 30 books uh, that I'm rereading or reading right now, and they're all marked up. Uh, if you do get the audio version of my book, by the way, I also recorded it. So if you want to spend five hours with me, uh, get the audio book version. Nice. Well, thanks so much. So yeah. Where can people find you then? Uh, so pretty simple. My consulting, public speaking, timash.com. And then the, the book is uh, primalbrain.com. Nice. Well, Tim, once again, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Thank you.